Hi, this is Chris, the Guitar Amp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we'll be looking at the repair process and specifically how to repair low cost amps. If this sounds like something you could be interested in, go grab yourself a coffee, sit beside me and let's get started. Oh, and um, a small double shot flat white for me, please. Oh, thank you. If an amp costs a couple of thousand dollars, then you just do what needs to be done to get the amp working again. But what if the amp only costs a couple of hundred dollars? A good tech needs to be very mindful of spending his client's money too readily. So to make the repair process even harder, uh, quite often inexpensive amps are cheap because they keep the manufacturing costs low. This is done by the use of printed circuit boards. Often the boards are computer populated with surface mount devices. These boards are cheap to make per unit, but are hard to repair and very often hard to even access the PCB without time consuming dismantling. So let's talk about my approach to fault finding. Other people will have different perspectives. So step one, check the fuses. I know you've heard it. The worst example I've seen of wrong fuses was in a vintage Marshall. Pretty sure it was a super lead and that requires a two amp fuse in Australia. And it had a 20 amp fuse. In other words, the fuse was useless. The transfer would have been catching fire before the fuse even thought about blowing. I know that my videos don't often include the fuse checking step. I edit so much out and they still end up being so long. But I will always check the fuse first. Sometimes a blown fuse is all that is wrong with the amp. But before I apply power, I put the amp on a current limiter. Voila. And or a Variac, and sometimes both. I plug the current limiter into the Variac and bring it up slowly. Second step. So we'll do our uh, initial test as if we don't have a schematic. If the amp reaches full power without a mountain Vesuvius reenactment, let's check the power supply. If it has not reached the operating voltage, then check the rectifier. Most low cost amps use solid state rectification, either as individual diodes or sometimes a bridge rectifier. Switch your multimeter to diode mode. Have I got a multimeter here? Yes, I do. You'll see there we have diode mode. We also have diode mode, which will either show a voltage, silicon, around about 0.6, or open when you have reverse polarised. A cheap amp rarely uses a tube rectifier, although we may look at a tube rectified low cost amp later for comparison. Step three. So the rectification is okay. The next element in every power supply is filtering, typically capacitor filtering. Some of the more expensive amps will use a combination of capacitors and chokes, but you won't find a choke in a cheaper amp because they're quite expensive. Now, if you are in a part of the world that mangles the English language by using such words as solder instead of solder or chassis instead of chassis, then modify your hearing to accept 60 hertz or 120 hertz, where I say 50 and 100 hertz. You can hear the difference between 50 hertz and 100 hertz. If you've heard it enough times, yeah, you can. But fortunately, many digital multimeters will display the frequency for us when we're measuring AC voltage. Oh, so Dad, where's the best place to measure hum? Good question, Harley. Putting your meter across the speaker connection is usually the easiest. If your hum is 100 hertz, you will most likely have an issue with your filter capacitors. 
or some component that's dragging the voltage down so low as to expose the 100 hertz ripple. Oh, but Dad, what if the hum is 50 hertz? Yeah, another good question, Harley. As 50 hertz is the mains frequency, which is the frequency that goes into and out of the power transformer, let's check that first. Let's check that all of the ground connections are nice and tight. And if it's a tube amp, you'll need to check the lead dress. Often the heater wires, as these go from one end of the amp near the power supply, all the way down to the preamp. Check your lead dress. Dad, do I see you wearing a lead dress when nobody else is at home? Shut up, Harley. Lead dress is the routing of the wires. In general, keep the heater wires. They're usually traditionally green. Quite often you see them as black and white these days, red and black, and they're, they should be twisted. Keep them away from other wires. And if they do have to cross, make sure they cross at 90 degrees if possible. It's not always possible, but the closer we can get to 90, the greater the, or the less likelihood there is of um, that hum being induced into another wire, which may well be a signal carrying wire. And the most susceptible uh, case where you'll see this very often is on preamp tubes. So remember your signal, the, the lowest signal in an amp, in a, in a preamp tube, sorry, is going to be coming in on pin two and pin seven. So you've got to make sure wherever you can that your Heater wires are kept as far away from pins two and seven as you can. And if they do have to cross each other, try and cross them at 90. 50 hertz hum can also be caused by poor earth connections. So check the ground connections are clean and tight. You will often see me soldering the earth connections directly to the chassis or chassis and grouping them to common earth points using a star type of configuration. One near the power supply and another near the input jack. The input jack has to be the quietest signal because that's where our guitar signal comes in and is the most susceptible to noise. The output transformer has inherent noise cancelling uh, characteristics. So let's just keep the power supply and the preamp separated both with good, solid, clean earths. Good earthing is easy on a new amp. As the amp ages, nuts get loose, if they're even held down with a nut. Quite often it's just a, a sheet metal screw. Make sure they're clean and tight. As an amp ages, they get loose, they get grotty. So a fault in electronics is not always obvious and may have multiple causes. For example, let's say a transistor has failed and certain clues uh, point to it being that specific culprit. You pull out the PCB, you order a replacement part and you solder it in. Sadly, we can't test the repair without reinstalling the PCB and rewiring all the connections. Then you apply power and the amp works for a few seconds and then it dies again. Out comes the PCB again. So we've learned a couple of lessons already. Number one, never order just one spare part. I will order at least four, sometimes 10. Why 10 you may ask? Well, I know it does seem excessive, but often there's a price break point at 10. And if I expect that I might need this part again, it's 10. Second lesson, when a semiconductor fails, it will usually fail open circuit, or it will fail short circuit. If it fails short circuit, there may be a surge of current. And unless the fusing is really spot on and good and correct value, this will often take out other components around the shorted semiconductor. Test everything that connects to the semiconductor 
before it and after it. Oh, but Dad, you always said that you can't always test components in circuit. That's right, Harley, and that's true. For example, we may not trust a 100K resistor to read 100K, but if it reads very high, then it must have failed because it can never read more than 100K. Even with other components in parallel, it won't read more than 100K. Likewise, if it were to read zero or a very low value, then we'd need to test that component by lifting a leg. Most of the time, this means removing the PCB. Again, you can see how costs add up. That one failed component could lead into a domino effect of failures. And if the app is from the 60s or 70s or even 80s, those semiconductors are very often obsolete. And even the recommended replacement equivalents, they're also obsolete. And it can take hours to reach that conclusion. Uh, now, if, we, if our amp has valves, we're lucky. They are much easier to test by substitution. If it's a solid state amp, the PCB will have to come out again. This may be easy on a small, cheap and well-designed amp like that. But if you have an overpriced piece of like a Oh, that's a messy booger. It will add many hours to the repair process. By this stage, your tech may have spent several hours and ordered parts just to hit a brick wall. I will only speak for myself, but I would then have no option but to return the non-working amp to the owner and charge him for my one hour bench fee. He's not gonna be happy. And I have lost even more money than he has on this repair. Sometimes the best advice we can give an owner is to do a Marie Kondo. Hug the amp, thank it for bringing joy, remove the speaker and trash the rest. Enough of the blah, blah, blah. Let's call this video done. And then we're going to come back and look at a real life example of a small, inexpensive amp that's not working, not producing any sound. Maybe as simple as a fuse, maybe more challenging. I don't know yet, but we're going to have a look at it and uh, we'll follow those steps. Do I have the schematics for it? Yes. Do you have the schematics for it? You shouldn't because um, they're proprietary to artists. Um, I'm not going to show you them either, but we're going to work through it as if neither of us have the schematic and see if we can solve it. All right. See you at the next video.